Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our hosted PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full color, full featured, full HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dial-ins are from Voxbone.com. All right, that leaves it up to me to tell you that this is VUC 581 for February 19th, 2016. We're going to be talking about an exciting new company with an exciting young man. But before we do that, I have to reveal that I'm really a human being, and I'm going to do that by doing this and reminding you that the EFF does some interesting things, and you could throw a $10 donation or whatever over to them at EFF.org. Now, uh, this gentleman is someone that I have known probably most of his life. Uh, and uh, it's Jordan Husney, who is the son of my very best friend since over 50 years. I'm going to let him say hello before I start talking him to death. Hi, Randy. Hello, everybody on VUC. Nice <laughs> to be with you today. Jordan, uh, your dad told me that when you were a young man, you reminded him of me, and you and I know what that means, which is that we were tech geeks and so on. What was your earliest tech experience? What were you doing? You know that uh, that Owen and I played with TV cameras in the basement and I video do. recorders and all that. Yeah. What were you doing, and at what age did you get started? I, well, I don't ever remember a time without uh, computing technology in the household. So. Um, much like yourself, um, my father has a love of technology and music, and he had a. And of course, you're both from Minneapolis. I also was uh, raised in in the Minneapolis area, and my father ran uh, a small record label, and he um, somebody recommended that he buy an Apple II, so he bought an Apple II Plus, and he thought, well, I'll take it home for the weekend. I think I was two and a half at the time. <laughs> and he had um, a few um, diskettes of some um, children's software for toddlers. It was really cool that even at that time there was software for really young children. And there was a game called Sticky Bear Numbers where you could just mash on a key on the keyboard and it would play a different animation. It was no more sophisticated than that. And I was totally wired as a two and a half year old. and um, started, I mean, I don't actually know how old I was, very young, probably four or five, latest six years old, copying um, basic source out of the Apple manual and seeing what it would do, and I've, I've, never, I've never been apart from a computer since. What, uh, just out of curiosity, oops, I double-clicked there, what um, what languages have you been most involved in? I know you probably are not coding that necessarily that much uh, coding, coding, coding that much today. Oh, but you mean what are your, yeah, well, everybody yeah. probably has to. But uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about the language thing. What, what are you into? Well, what do you love and hate? I was really, I consider myself very lucky because particularly for somebody that um, grew up writing software um, I I started I started in basic and then I was very fortunate in um, meeting some kids in junior high school and middle school um, who uh, were writing C they were writing Pascal and they were writing C and um, I did a science fair project uh, I, Randy did you keep up your your amateur radio license I've never asked it you it dropped it dropped uh, me too years ago. So I, I when when I was a young kid, my, my dad was a radio DJ um, for a little bit, and he encouraged me to get my ham license, and that's how I started like falling in with this crowd of people who are like me, and I did this um, IP over amateur radio uh, project as a science fair project, right. 
And that doing that project got me a little bit of recognition, and I ended up joining this company that's still around. They're still great. They're called Digi International. Um, they're um, a, a machine-to-machine communications company based uh, in the, in Minnesota. And I um, fell in with a crowd of of old wolves that. Um, did a lot in supercomputing and also did a lot in network communications and uh, I just started writing tons and tons and tons and tons of C and doing a lot of embedded programming and and um, so I would say I I did I probably have produced the most volume of of C and a little bit of C++ and then of course like much of the world started to transition into other technologies uh, and as I started writing um, Web apps, uh, uh, Python, Ruby. Now um, for, at Parable, I am as much the founder as I am uh, a programmer on the staff, and um, we're writing nearly everything in JavaScript, which is um, really interesting for me. Okay, so um, in uh Gosh, I was going to say something, and then I freaked out because I think the wrong microphone is being selected here. Let me check that. You sound great here. Yes, it is. I cleared my throat, muted, and it switched to me. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I wanted to remind you that back in the AOL uh, disc in the, the AOL CD in the mailbox days, that goes back. You were probably maybe just uh, in your twenties, I guess. Seems I think I was even younger. I think when, when ago. AOL was shipping this, I bet I was like 15. Well, but you were working already for that company, yeah, I think. And, I was. And it was in Minnesota. Yeah. yeah, you were young. And I remember, this is just to set the stage for, uh, you know, kind of our relationship, was that uh, one of the first times I met you, you and your dad were over at uh, wherever I was staying, and my laptop wasn't working. I couldn't get it on the Internet so there was some kind of like windsock issue or something, and you said, "Oh, that's easy." It was, it was so it's just so funny. I can still remember that. It was just a, yeah. a really a real laugh. And you were already one of the star employees of that company, whatever that was. That was in Minnesota, right? Same yeah, ball. Yeah. yeah, and actually, it was funny because you know, I it, for this crowd in particular, I data communications and communications in general is just where my heart's at, and um, I. I ran a, a BBS, a bulletin board system, for a while in Minnesota, and really just like was deeply fascinated by modems and by modulation, demodulation, and um, that company. When I was 18, ended up moving me to Japan, and we ended up creating this crazy system where um, the Japanese mobile phones are this this old proprietary standard called PIOFs. And we made a thing that was a, a PCI card for a server, and we could have uh, 48 simultaneous modem streams coming in from these wireless phones that people were carrying on the subway to do internet communications, high-speed internet. It was the, the world's first, and that was super fun. That was one of the most fun, fun things I've ever got to participate along in. Cool. And uh, you want to take us up to how you... Why and how you started Parable, and what, and then we'll get, obviously get to what it's about. But how did yeah. the demand? How did the genesis happen? So uh, my route was really circuitous. So uh, ham radio to um, working as an engineer and embedded software engineer at Digi ended up um, creating a lot of custom solutions to connect all kinds of weird things in the world. So making machines communicate. If it was like a, a, an oil drum or a deep fryer in a big restaurant or something like that, um, I got to design a lot of that stuff and it was super fun. And I got to work with a lot of different kinds of organizations and found that a lot of, um, a lot of different types of, of companies were, uh, you know, if the first struggle was like, oh, crap, we need a website, then the next struggle was, oh, now we have to connect everything else aside from you know our brand and our people. Now we got to start connecting our machines. And I started to see how this was was rippling through global society. And I had this opportunity to join this um, think tank, strategic consultancy, and then later um, organizational development consultancy called Undercurrent in uh, New York City. And I came to them actually by listening to this uh, program 
um, put out by WNYC and uh, National Public Radio in the States called um, Radio Lab. They did some underwriting, which is how I, I found out about them, started reading their blog, thought that they were super smart, and joined them and started doing consulting on um, the broader implications of connected technology and society. Principally, my principal client was General Electric and, and starting to dig into um, the industrial internet, and then that led us into different areas. We started doing things in digital fabrication and 3D printing and so on. And I started to realize that the technical problems are one thing, and the technology speaks for itself. You know, it's, it, it is a tool that achieves a, an end, but the societal shifts in changing the way that people work around those technologies is actually a much harder and for, for how I was changing, uh, a much more difficult problem. And it still has to do with communications. It's all about how, how people respond to one another. And I started to look backward on my life as a, as a young man in corporate America um, as a teenager and thinking, man, there was some really screwed up stuff there. Like we were a technology company, but um, it was very hierarchical and it wasn't clear why decisions were being made the way they were. Like this whole thing around um, like unending meetings that don't ever seem to come to decisions, um, decisions being revisited, and so on. Or, or like consider for a moment like the three-hour status telephone call that's something that <laughs> a lot of people in, in companies experience. just didn't feel right to me. And uh, at Undercurrent, we started to transition into thinking about new ways of working that emulated a bit of um, agile software practices and how to um, how to apply rhythms and teaming to work that isn't around technology development. And uh, long story short, what ended up happening is Undercurrent sold itself to a, a large startup company uh, in New York called Quirky. And uh, Quirky only ended up operating for about four months after that acquisition. I, I played the role of, of VP of platform and COO there and had this brilliant tech team um, at Quirky that all of a sudden was out of work. And we started looking at um, what we wanted to do together. And we felt like people weren't recognizing what we were recognizing, that software eats everything in the end, as Mark Andreessen said. And um, the org chart in, and the way that people team really hasn't changed all that much inside of companies for the last 100 years. And we want to develop software that will end up eating the org chart and end up eating the way that people collaborate inside of organizations. And uh, that was how Parable was formed. And, and what, what tools, tools did you look, look at, at uh, um, before? You've probably, you know, who's had a lot of success in collaboration. I'm talking collaboration now. This, yeah. this may yeah. not be the area you're talking about, but it certainly leads up to the topic. Um, Slack has got to yeah. be the big the elephant in the room there. Um, I don't know what else there is. What, what are the, some of the things that you looked at and maybe either dismissed or thought, hmm, not bad? Well, so we ended up, um, at Undercurrent, we, what we would do is we would work with a really large company. And um, we would help people think really critically about the way that they were working. There's this old um, uh, adage, um, you know, perhaps you've heard of it. It's the, the what is water um, uh, essay and then talk that David Foster Wallace gave. It's just brilliant. It's, you know, um, uh, an old fish swims by two young fish. And uh, the, the old fish says, you know, how's, how's the water today? And then the one young fish turns to the other and says, what's water? Mm -hmm. And um, most people tend not to think too critically about the, about the environment that they're operating in. And we would sit down with folks and we'd have them think critically about the way they work together in order to achieve some aim. And um, as part of that, we would introduce new human practices and we'd also introduce new tools. And Slack... Um, it's crazy that Slack is only two years old and, you know, is, like, valued at several billion and has millions and millions of users. But um, Slack was in our tool belt for sure. Uh, it got people to recognize that work was not synonymous with their inbox and that um, it's a terrible cue for uh, receiving work and, and executing things because it tends to be non-prioritized and, and conflated and not time-sensitive and also very inhuman when you start to write emails like, you know, dear person sitting next to me, I hope you're doing well. 
I'm wondering if you've had a chance to look at X, Y, and Z. Sincerely yours, your close colleague. Like, that's really silly. Um, so Slack has some very subtle transformative properties. Uh, Trello was something that we uh, got people on to make their work visual. Um, uh, I'm a huge proponent of, of what I like to call multiplayer software, meaning that you're looking at the same view of the same work and you can collaborate on it in, in real time. Uh, and, you know, there's this uh, plethora of, um, uh, like, meeting enhancement software. One of the first, uh, and I, I'm not a particularly big fan of the product, but do.com uh, is sort of interesting. There's, um, uh, I think it's called work... Uh, worklife.com, uh, you, you'll find these sort of like optimize your meeting kind of uh, pieces of software that are starting to come out. Um, those things are, are interesting. Um, we don't see ourselves as competitive to Slack. In fact, um, that's a, a, a platform, even though I hesitate to use the word platform, it's a platform that we, we want to leverage. Um, the way that we look at things is that there are if you take any collection of people, doesn't matter how big or small an organization you can kind of think about it in three layers. There's the strategy part, which is um, people come together around a collective vision to try and do something together. And being able to disseminate that vision and, and make it like GitHub, where you can push and pull on that vision together and understand why you're all there is super important. Um, the second is structure, like what are our actual teams and then how do we arrange and what are our rules for working together is really important. And then the last bit is systems. And it's sort of like, what are our rituals and tools that we use as a culture to it, to, in, the, in the structure to achieve the, the strategy? Um, we're, we're, uh, we're riding on, we're going to start on top of that systems layer and then work our way up. And um, we think about cycles in each of those layers. So Slack is kind of like the, the tightest cycle that you can have. It's the real-time communication. I'm talking with my friends. On the outside of that, you have a, a weekly rhythm of like what you're trying to do, your sprint structure in agile software development. And then you might have another cycle on top of that that's like your monthly meeting where you might decide to change your policies. And then you might have another thing where you're changing your structure and so on and so forth till you're changing your vision on the outside. So if you think about those cycles, we're, we have um, plans for creating specific tools at, at, at many of those different levels. If you look at the structure of the VUC, for example, it's very small, so this may not give you a chance to say anything, but I'll tell you what it is. We have about five, six people who are core people, and uh, for example, Michael, who's, who's in the Hangout, we have a couple of people who are absent. Shame on you guys. They're traveling, I guess. Uh, but uh, Michael, for example, does certain things uh, systematically. I can't do the graphics. He's got all that under control. He will do the slide that uh, presents... Uh, either the topic, and sometimes we do promos for events like Comedia World coming up 18th of May in Berlin. Please be there and join us. Uh, how is that for a segue? That wasn't a segue even. Anyway, Michael does certain things. I do certain things. Um, sometimes we need other people to do certain things, but it's such a small team. We talk on Wire, which is like Slack with no bots, I guess you might, one way to put it. Are you familiar with Wire at all? You know I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we, we use that, but Wire is mostly I am uh, putting in a plug for them as well. They do high-quality audio for up to five people, so completely encrypted. It's uh, really good for chat and exchanging graphic files, and they're, they may be moving towards video. I can't remember if that's a secret or not, but it's obvious that sooner or later that will happen. Uh, so that's that tool, and that I don't know how well wire scales to large organizations, but I'm suspecting from what you just said, Jordan, that you're looking at a much more complex uh, industrial, industrial, commercial, enterprisorial thing with teams. We don't have teams. We have one team. But you're talking teams, maybe departments, and all of that. So well, the, the, um, the way that we're thinking is that work is changing rapidly. Like in the, in the, in the olden days, when Communic it really all comes from communication. When communication was much more expensive and you, you um, the only way that you could organize human behavior was creating these batches of orders, you had to necessarily be super hierarchical and big was a big strength. Like hierarchical, disciplined, um, let me give you the orders, let me give you the strategy, you carry it out. 
Now what we're starting to see, and, and like um, open source software development telegraphed a lot of the way that um, people are starting to change, you're starting to see these um, somewhat ragtag coalitions of people that share interests coming together, and this is not new, it's been going on for decades now, uh, coming together and being able to coordinate in a much more haphazard way, but creating super large impact. So when we think about the future of organizations, we think less about how do we enable the GEs and the American Expresses and the Pepsis and the Fortune 100s of the world to be able to communicate much more tightly in a hierarchical mode. We think of it more of how do we enable a small team to operate with a bunch of other small teams because we think that's more what the world of work looks like. So our first tool uh, is called Action. We're mid-development uh, of it. It itself is open source. The way we're starting our company is radically different. We're not going out to venture capitalists saying, give us 1.5 or $2 million to create a team. It's five of us who are not paying ourselves yet. We are creating a, and we're about to launch it next week, an open compensation model where you participate in our software development. You, if you feel like you're aligned to our purpose, um, you work on these little uh, bits of work from our uh, GitHub issue queue, and if you do enough of them, then we'll actually give you equity in our company. It's a very different model. Um, but our first tool, Action, is this thing to manage the weekly rhythm of a small team. So you can imagine at VUC, the five of you all have a common view of what projects you're working on, and once a week, you uh, simply say, hey, this is um, what we're working on, and uh, you can add things, you can remove things, you can change the priority, but it gives you team clarity in that way. Um, and the other thing that we're building in is if you're working with other teams, you can broadcast as a team what you're, what you're blocked on. And if somebody else can help you out, um, in a more classical mode, if it's inside of a, a traditional organization, like you have managers that are a different team than your team, they can see what you're stuck on, and they might be able to just send you a note being like, yeah, 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 go ahead. And it hopefully will change the relationship between teams where it's more API driven. Like, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm responsible for, um, and uh, here's how we can help unblock each other from the things that we're stuck on. It's really interesting, it's really interesting because, because a lot, a lot of, people of people who we work with, with now, now get some echo. I guess that's from you. Let me pause let me and let Chrome catch up with echo cancellation. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, we, uh, one of the people who's missing, for example, uh, two of them, in fact, uh, are with TruePhone. TruePhone, I don't know how many employees they have, but they're all over the world, and uh, this is, it's really a shame that James is not here to hear this, but we'll have to um, get him to get in touch with you, and uh, you should have some talks, because, like I say, they're all over the place. Um, also, having worked with the people of Wire, that's something like 70 people. Um, and again, you know, we, we've worked with a lot of different organizations. The VUC is also uh, close to people like Counterpath. And again, I don't know how large they are, but these are bigger companies. Um, Michael may have some ideas too, so we should probably look into this. It'd be great to have a view, like a beta or alpha view of this. Uh, I'm not saying this in any, for any selfish reason, but it might be fun to expose a few people. So when you're ready to do that, uh, let me know. And also, let's let everybody know. Your, your website is obviously was put up like three days ago or something, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so there's not much there, I know. But uh, are there, is there a, a, a Git URL? Or first yeah. of all, the URL, I, I put it in. Let me see if I think I've got it here. So the URL currently, if it's correct, oh, I have to turn it on. Does that look right? No, that's, that's the name of the, I, I can't see because that's the. That's it. That's okay. it. You got it. Because the film strip is in the way it's blocking the end of it. Parable.co. Right. So yeah. you go to, go to parable.co. Is there a GitHub or any simple... Oh, there it is. Somebody stuck it in. How about that? Yeah. How yeah. did he find that? Uh, it's, so um, uh, Parable uh, has a GitHub repository. And here's, here's what we're doing. So... Um, uh, our first tool is called Action. It is a tool that helps a team make its work explicit and run on a weekly rhythm. Um, there's the, the GitHub repository. You can join our community. Um, next week, we're, uh, you can already see the, the GitHub issue uh, queue. Next week, uh, we're releasing our um, uh, compensation model where it, it follows after um, 
there's an organization that just started in the States called uh, 18F. It's a digital transformation um, consultancy for the U.S. government. They came up with this really cool model where they make all the work that is small that they're looking for open. You can go and see it, and you can just join, and then they, uh, the, the government employees that work for that consultancy can, are authorized to spend up to uh, 3500 bucks. Um, we're taking a very similar attack. We're saying, hey, this is our organization. This is what we stand for. This is all the work that we're looking for. If you want to um, help us out with something, we'll compensate you with equity because we don't have very much money right now. Um, so we're asking to co-develop our first product, uh, which is open source. It's fully owned, if you will, uh, by the community because we believe so strongly that um, creating this tool will help um, change uh, the way that people work together. Um, we're publishing the full designs, uh, meaning the full journey map of what that uh, tool looks like. You can see uh, there's a little animated GIF in the readme.md. Um, and the first thing that we published in that source repository is an example of our software architecture. So making um, multiplayer real-time applications is fairly challenging. Um, Google Docs, of course, is one of the best examples of a real-time collaborative application. Slack, of course, would be another one. Google Docs is really cool because you can, multiple people can, can uh, be changing the same thing at the same time, and those change sets are merged in real time. That's a, a thing for uh, computer science geeks called operational transforms. There's a, a new thing like swarm.js has a real-time differences system. Um, we, we've taken a very simple approach to this. We're doing last right wins uh, using a thing called rethink.db and our front-end framework is based on React and Redux, but it's a pattern that we think lots of people can use in order to create real-time applications. We're hoping that they will find our architecture interesting and will help us build on it and enhance it and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, yeah, sounds, that sounds, 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 sounds absolutely fascinating. 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 Did, did you, you recall, recall the name, the name of, the of the technology that, that Google, Google acquired that turned, turned into Wave? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, that team has had a very interesting trajectory. Um, I can't remember the the first company. Right. But yeah, it became Wave, which was all operational transforms. They published a bunch of papers. Then Wave became Google Docs. And then uh, a, a couple of those team members uh, spun out and created uh, Quip.com, which is kind of interesting, um, also from a real-time multiplayer app development. Right. I thought Google Docs predated Wave. Well, they... Google Docs? It, uh, yeah, Google Docs yeah. create well, the, the original form did, right? But it wasn't uh, shareable in the same way, I think, is what happened, right? If I'm not mistaken. Okay. I mean, they were shareable, but you couldn't, like, see the... It wasn't live. If I, That's my memory of it, anyway. Yeah, actually, I, I have to admit, I, I don't remember. But I, if anyone uh, is out there and does know the history, definitely uh, share sure. a link. Because Google... Google Docs was purchased in as well, but it was purchased in before Wave came along, and then Wave was merged into it, I think, at some point. So, yeah, it makes sense. But Docs was kind of like an office replace, and still is to some extent, it's sort of a cloud office replacement. Um, no, but the big thing with Wave, the, there's these big things that come in. One of them was, for example, when Ajax first came out, this was a huge deal where people go, go look at this web page. Look, you're not reloading the page, and it's being, you know, that was one big thing. And the, the, uh, thing that you mentioned, Jordan, that uh, was apparent to me in Wave, that's the first I saw of it, was you're in a document and five pe people could be in there messing with the document and you would see the changes live, which Google yeah. has put into a lot of things. And I assume, I actually don't use Docs that much, but I assume that if two people are looking at the same doc, you see that effect. And I'm not sure, Michael, that that was apparent before Wave. I think that that's part of the tech, tech they bought, but I could be wrong. Speaking of wrong... Uh, what else do we need to, t before we move on a little bit, Jordan, I don't know how much time you have, but a couple of questions for you that, that are not uh, Parable related. Yeah. You want to comment on the name, by the way, Parabolic? We, you're a ham and I'm a ham, so we know the Parabolic Reflector yeah, and all that's that. Right. Does yeah. it come from there? I mean, is it... Hey. We, uh, the inspiration for the company came from a practice that um, we had developed at, at Undercurrent of journey mapping... Um, uh, things that were not in the software domain, so more in the software, uh, more in the service design side of things, making little cartoons of how customers experienced um, 
uh, companies. For example, like uh, I'm going to pick on somebody that I think uh, does a terrible job. So Hertz is ridic- like many car rental companies are ridiculously poor at customer service. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure we could all name experiences that we've had. Jerry Seinfeld made very um, uh, famous the whole idea that you have a reservation and there's no car there. Uh, I feel like you get those types of, of experiences if you're not journey mapping out the thing and you like understand what experience you're actually shipping as a product to your customers. I often say, your experience is your product. Period. Full stop. Um, Parable is a play on a parable-like um, story. Yeah, yeah, like L.E. However, it also has and is etymo- etymologically related to um, arcs, like story arc, like parabola, like parabolic dish. And um, uh, we've been having a lot of fun with the name. So you'll notice in our, in our branding, if we have an image, we try to, we try to hide a parable in, in everything, a parabola, rather, in everything that we ship. And a parable, maybe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's a parable to everything. OK, that makes sense. Um, we've, we've got the uh, call to action, literally. Wow, what a great pun. You go to <laughs> call to action, meaning the action from, uh, all right, enough of that. We spoke briefly. Are we done with Parable for the moment, or is there other things that you want to say about the future of it? No, that's great. C- come on in, join our community. We're going to be popping up our own Slack instance real soon. We'd, we'd uh, love to hear from you. That's great, and I think that there's going to be a lot of interest, and I'll continue to remind people who didn't make it today uh, to check it out, because I think it's going to be something to get into on the ground floor to take a look and see what happens and watch the development. All right, a couple of things we were talking about earlier. Corrado may want to uh, join in on this discussion. There's been so much uh, virtual ink spilt about the FBI order to uh, tell Apple to help them open up a, one single phone um, without going in. Do you, you, you know the story, so what I'd be interested in is your take, but I just wanted to introduce it by saying there's a lot of people going absolutely nuts about the security implications and you, we can't do this because it's going to be crazy and uh, etc. And I think it's going to take a couple of days for the thoughts to, to even out a little bit and quiet down. But there are a couple of articles, and I'll be darned if I did. There's no good way to tell you where to go to see these, for those of you who don't know. But these are very respected people in security and um, blogging who have written these things and have laid out in great detail the way the phone itself works, the difference between the phone that this person was using, which belonged to his employer, and the newer iPhones that have this embedded. Uh, fingerprint reader and so on, sensor. Um, so you need to take all of this into consideration, but if, if you're documented on that, Jordan, it'd be interesting to hear what you, have, what you think about the case, whether it's what your opinion is or whether you think it's uh, where it's going to go. Either way. Yeah, so I, I haven't been up to the minute on reading about uh, the latest. Um, a friend of mine, a professor uh, at NYU's ITP, who he's uh, maybe best known for being the co-founder of, of the Arduino platform, Tom Igo, has been um, talking about it on Twitter a bunch. Anil Dash, who I know you know, Randy, has been talking about it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we, we've been back-channeling uh, a little bit on how uh, we're... This is a really important moment, I think, societally, uh, and there are, there are many more moments to come on the... Uh, education of the public on the um, important benefits of privacy on the internet and encryption. And it was fascinating to watch the the Apple story unfold where um, it was about the I saw the uh, I saw related to this the um, hubbub around Apple not um, offering the replacement of the the thumbprint reader on buttons and uh, being able to uh, replace that particular part uh, because it is, uh, of course, key to the end-to-end security of the phone. And it started with Apple uh, filing a a lawsuit or responding to a lawsuit, but not um, educating the public as to 
what the reasons were for why that wasn't a good thing for them to engage in, to be able to clone uh, these cryptographically secure um, uh, thumbprint uh, reading buttons. You and know how far, excuse me for interrupting you, Jordan, but yeah. you, know how, you know that that went further. They've come out with, they're coming out with an update of iOS because it was bricking the phones if you screwed with it too much. Right, you knew right, right. Okay. yeah. Yeah, and they're thanks. they're fixing it. Yeah, so the, the it's a very it's a really interesting thing where um, I think where Apple was getting that particular instance wrong is they were at that moment they responded solely in the courts and they weren't educating the public on why that was the case. And I think that um, a, a large company like Apple that that has more money than they know what to do with literally has more money than they know what to do with it. They, they they're constantly pressured to pay out more dividends to their shareholders, could do a much better job in making it easier for themselves in explaining um, how cryptography works, why it's important, and uh, why we shouldn't allow uh, governmental entities to situationally open up uh, and have back doors into all of our personal devices. Um, I know that's more of a, a position than a... Than a uh, a perspective, say, on on uh, on the FBI issue, but um, I worked for uh, three years for a startup company in Palo Alto that was building um, core internet routers, and it was really illuminating as a young engineer to learn that there are uh, governmental standards where you have to provide a sniffing interface for the government in in those particular devices and. Um, yeah, that was deeply unsettling, and it's still deeply unsettling to me now because I like to think that the, the societal benefits, like, oh, I don't know, being able to exchange in commerce over the Internet outweighs uh, truly horrific things that happen to us, but not on a scale that uh, improves our life um, to the same degree as being able to transact things, uh, transact communications in a secure way. And I think most of us learned about what you just described uh, from the Snowden revelations. I had no idea that this would... And you think about it, you go, is that possible? Is it really possible? And, of course, it turns out that there's proof that it is. Uh, another related thing, Jordan, I don't know, you're it, it, former well, ham, so uh, you... What was that? A comment, I, comment Randy, if, okay. a comment, Randy, if I may. And, sure. and that is, the, the problem we have is, is um, the carbon-based entities involved... Uh, the the arcs, as you're fond of of such things, that you have the arc of the intellectual and the arc of the emotional, a, a into the sphere of the political, and and yeah. these things are wildly divergent realities, and yeah. and so it, who knows who knows, and the, the technical and the intellectual come into play, but but as we know from the process of elections in general. You can motivate people better with fear than you can an intellectual argument, and, yeah. and that's where we happen to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think the the really um, uh, both uh, horrific and um, also um, I'm not exactly sure how to say it. It's both horrific and beneficial. Uh, is that technology is uh, in many ways um, beyond regulation at this particular point. Like, uh, Edward Snowden, for as much as the government would like to know what he's up to at all times, has proven to be uh, extremely adept at outmaneuvering uh, a very large, very, very smart um, group of folks. Uh, and he's been able to do that using uh, largely GPG, just open source software to be able to communicate with, um, uh, you know, uh, the reporters who are his friends. Um, I, I, I think that it's fascinating to see that um, technologically the clock isn't going to move backward. So in many ways, I think um, the folks who are capable of both intellectualizing and communicating around these important technological and societal shifts uh, should step up their game to try and minimize the amount of fear and sadness that we have around these technologies. But yeah, I totally hear what you're saying. It's, it's uh, going to be real hard. I think education is coming on that. I, I, the where I wanted to go uh, right after that, um, before Michael's comment, was that uh, we participated in a thing from Dave Tot and Wi-Fi. He's someone who has devoted practically his life to uh, improving Wi-Fi, and he and a bunch of people 
250 engineers, very famous from, from Vince Cerf to people like that who are big time on the internet, um, responded to the FCC. That's why I started to mention ham radio. The FCC is so afraid of software defined radios in routers, Wi Fi routers, mm -hmm. that they've now there's all these initiatives to freeze that so that you can't touch it, you can't repair it. You can't debug it. You can't reverse engineer it. So this is another. This is the same vibe, actually, isn't it? The same fear of, um, which which is completely unreasoned. <laughs> unreasoned. <laughs> what am I looking for? <laughs> unreasoned, I guess, is the right word. Yeah. Uh, where it's just not reasonable. In other words, how are you ever going to fix anything if you can't look into it and see how it works? How are people? When you think about the security. Uh, problems that come up. They're almost always discovered by... Microsoft never discovers their own security no. shit. I mean, it always comes from somebody else. Yeah, so some, right. you've got to have all these people out there, like Dave and, and a lot of the other people who were involved in that. Um, and I was curious whether you'd heard much about it, because there's an, yet another movement. So Dave went to the FCC in Washington, met with a bunch of people. They said their piece. There's a petition out there. A bunch of us signed it and all that. Now the FCC has just recently, and I, I don't know the specifics, but there's now yet another thing where they're going to do this and that. They're opening your cable box, and it's going to be transmitting. I, you know, where is this going? Everything has to be encrypted all the time. It's so funny. You know, <laughs> I, I remember, I can't for the life of me remember. It's, I, I feel terrible about it. I, I can't remember the name of these young men, but I met these um, white hat hackers um, Oh gosh, maybe it was seven or eight years ago now, and I was deeply involved in developing uh, the some of the standards within the Zigbee Alliance. So this is uh, wireless uh, mesh communications, low power radio, and uh, I was at a conference, and the, these two young men um, approached me, and they're like, "Hey, uh, we have this awesome software defined radio, and we've been um, doing uh, analyses on a number of the." Um, uh, security attributes of the standard that you guys have put together, and we found the following vulnerabilities. And I think about uh, the ability for those guys to freely explore and poke around in published standards using whatever methodology, like they don't have to pull a license from anyone, for them to be able to do that actually ensures the safety and, you know, the, the, these are systems that are used in all kinds of critical systems. To be able to have that stuff happen out in the open is, is the, the benefits far outweigh the risk the risks as far as, as I see. You know, there's a question I forgot to ask that was in, it's going to be a little bit out of context, but it's still with regard to action and where you guys are going, Jordan, and that is, and I'm, I'm really sorry, White Book, I, I, I saw this and then we moved on, uh, and he was asking how traditional communications like voice and video play into what you're doing, mm. and we should... Uh, preface this by saying that, for example, on wire, as I said, you could jump to audio. And one of the things uh, in the business, they call it escalate all to audio uh, or video. But right. anyway, so how is there, um, are you looking at how that's going to fit in? It's a good question. I'm really sorry I didn't ask you before. So let's jump back to action sure. and the future of your company. Sure. What, what's on that? So uh, we, you know, it's so important to decide what you have a stake in and what you don't. And Right now, we have been focusing our thought on uh, mobilizing the community and helping folks think about their teams on a weekly rhythm, um, where how they talk in inside of that week is largely up to them. If they wanted to uh, escalate to audio on wire, that's uh, totally um, up to them. Uh, what is interesting to note is that um, most folks are, are uh, familiar with the idea of calendar hell. They're just uh, overscheduled um, period, and they always feel, you know, it's like going to the all-you-can-eat buffet and feeling like, oh man, I didn't try all the dishes in any in any particular week, and that's a that's a modern affliction because for the first time, again, the cost of communication is so low that you can just like wrangle calendars with anyone that you want. One of the things that we're trying to help people with is get a handle on what's essential for them and um, provide some of that open space to be able to communicate with people in a far more human way. And so instead of like thinking, oh, I need to get FaceTime with Randy in order to talk about X, I better schedule a meeting, uh, perhaps you've actually created some calendar time for yourself where you can just be hanging out on wire, and then we can talk 
like Randy and I can talk like two human beings, and if we decide that voice or video is the best way to do it, those technologies can serve us rather than feeling like we are slaves to our calendar schedule. Uh, that's part of the, the shift that we're trying to encourage. But, of course, these are complicated human behaviors, and we don't want to dictate to anyone how they should, uh, how they should do anything. Sure. How is mobile going to play? I should have asked this long ago, but uh, how does mobile play into this? I mean, after all, you're on a much higher level, so that's, I'm not, it's not like I'm asking, you know, how you do a uh, bit rotate in C. That's not the question. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. more, is, uh, what is the vision for, you know, everybody keeps telling us every day, well, it's mobile, it's all going to be mobile, it's all mobile. Personally, I don't care. Until I die, I probably will not be typing on a mobile anytime soon. I talk yeah. on it, I use it. Yeah. But, I mean, how is mobile fitting into to what you're doing? Well, um, one of the cool things, scary things and sad things about uh, society is that we are um, uh, more distributed, working together in closer-knit groups that are further apart than ever before. So as part of that, um, you are going to be on the, mo on the move and you still want to participate in along with your team. Um, there are just um, times when you're going to be in the back of a taxi cab in Shanghai and you're still going to want to look at the same thing. So mobile is really important. But as we sit down with our users, and I'm still fairly involved in, in large organizations here in New York, and, and I try to get to know what our, uh, how our users act and behave, most people still, even executives, still bring in a laptop to the meeting. And um, if they're on a weekly rhythm, that's their primary interaction tool. But you've got, you have to, if you're building a product today, you have to design for mobile at the same time that you're designing for desktop. So even though our first cut's going to be you know, an open MVP uh, of this meeting, uh, weekly meeting tool, uh, weekly rhythm tool, um, the, uh, le the responsive layout of the tool will support mobile out of the box. And, but we know that we can push that direction um, far, far more heavily. But um, for this kind of a tool, we think that it's, it's desktop with a few remotes that are mobile and tablet. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like Periscope, right? I'm sure you guys have spoke about Periscope. Uh, that only really works in the mobile domain because it's about live video anywhere on the move. I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, of course, it was always open. But I'm going to remind people that they can unmute by hitting star 6 on ZipDX or type in something in IRC, which I should have warned you, Jordan, but there hasn't been that much activity. That was just one question uh, to IRC. And uh, what else am I looking at? I, I dropped Twitter because the, the, the current Twitter app for Mac, for OS X, is the most atrocious piece of work <laughs> I've seen in so long. Yeah. It's just a piece of crap. I can't Im yeah. imagine how they managed to screw it up over a single update where it just doesn't even work anymore. But anyway, uh, so, I, so I'm not watching Twitter right now, but uh, we are watching IRC. We are watching ZipDX. I don't see anybody unmuting. Michael, muting Michael Corrado, you, we didn't yes. get you a chance to speak. Any questions or comments? Well, I had a comment on uh, the previous train where we were looking at uh, how we uh, address the question of Apple and security and software-defined radios and so on. Uh, I, uh, I'm still on Twitter. Uh, I'm still looking and feeling there, and I've seen uh, uh, a post from uh, Mr. McAfee that claimed that he has access to a number of uh, white hat hackers that they can crack every uh, iPhone on, on the planet in about 30 minutes. So if they want any, the FBI wants any help, he's available. Uh, so there you go. Uh, but again, uh, how do we reconcile the $3 PC with software-defined radios that are available to everybody to hack into and what the FCC and other uh, organizations want to do to lock in us in, 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 in lock devices that we cannot uh, modify when we can, in fact, recreate them in software for, for nothing, practically? <laughs> That is is beyond the control of any any organization, government, or anything else. The, it's not a healthy tendency that um, like the, it was brought up a long time ago. But John Deere tractors thing, where they uh, forbid uh, an owner from modifying the program, blah blah blah. And it might even be well-meaning in that they could change 
change a couple of bytes of code and suddenly the tractor runs people over and this, the, uh, yeah. the dead man switch is broken. Or I, I get that. I get that. But uh, apparently there was a lot of, a lot of um, uproar over that incident and the fact that, hey, we sell you this product and yet it doesn't belong to you apparently. So that is a problem. Um, but Isn't that the same uh, that, that happens with Microsoft and the software that we don't own the software, we're just renting it indefinitely. True. Probably okay. true of action, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely true. Renting it. Everything's right. as a service, so you know, we don't own it. Nobody owns anything anymore. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, action, action's free uh, and will always be free. But um, when we, it, you know, it's interesting um, to think about so there's the political realm and like how how we'll respond as a as a as a government and as a political entity to the shifts that are going on. But there's also like if your job was national security, like aside from the policy that you're going to set, if you're thinking about all right, how am I going to make society safe? It's fair to assume, and I'm sure people are already thinking about this, but it's nice to be reminded. It's fair to assume that even if we had backdoors that were vulnerabilities that were discovered in the um, additional vulnerabilities discovered in some of the core cryptographic technologies that we use, you can always retreat to one-time pat. You can always go back to just XORing random bytes from, from atomic decay if you want. So if you want purely secure communications, we already live in that world. And it's only going to get easier to distribute those bytes. It's only going to get easier... Um, and, you know, hey, quantum entanglement could be a thing. Like, who knows? Maybe two clandestine services are going to, or are already are, communicating in that particular way. So if that's n the new reality, then, you know, how should we live within that reality where that's, that's possible? I'm sure it doesn't look like the security equivalent of, uh, you know, TSA uh, at airports <laughs> in the U.S. I'm sure it's not going to be that damn cumbersome. Um, uh, but it'll. I, I hope to live long enough to see how this whole thing shakes out. Well, I hope you do too, Jordan. It was great to and very gracious of you to accept uh, the uh, invitation. I hope your dad's watching or will watch. I I sent him a message, but he didn't answer. He's busy. He's probably on the road with some new singer or something. Oh, Papa. <laughs> anyway, hey, it's great. Uh, hope to see you again in person one of these days. If you, uh, you know, we're no longer in Paris, we're in Bordeaux, but if you ever get over here, you know we'd love to see you. I would love to see you too, and man, that's uh, what a nice part of the world to come and visit too. It'd be great it to is. see you, Andy. It is. Okay, Jordan, thanks, and thanks to everybody who makes this thing possible. We're going to close off the uh, what we laughingly call a broadcast now, and apparently it did work. Thanks to uh, Google for making it work once again, 581. Okay, see you next week. Thanks for watching, and thanks for joining us.